Efforts to reform the criminal justice system in this country continue to gain momentum. We'll talk about what's going on here in Wisconsin this morning on For the Record. Good morning, I'm Neil Heinen. For many of us, it was the relatively recent report on racial disparities that illustrated the deficiencies in our criminal justice system. But in fact, awareness of the need for prison reform has been growing for at least much of the last 10 years, from academic research to serious journalism efforts to community, grassroots, advocacy, and re-entry programs, more and more people are calling for major reform of policies from drug laws to use of solitary confinement. One of the most prominent efforts in Wisconsin is led by the faith-based organization, Wisdom. My guests this morning are Reverend Jerry Hancock, a veteran of more than 30 years working in the criminal justice system before joining the ministry. Reverend Hancock is the director of First Congregational United Church of Christ prison ministry project, and Talib Akbar, who is, among other things, a former prisoner and a member of Wisdom. And thank you both very much for joining me this morning. Glad to be here. Um, I want to uh, be accurate in sort of capturing the state of, of this conversation in our country right now, Jerry. Um, it's been going on for a while, but what I'm, what I'm sensing is that it is, it is gaining some awareness both among citizens and even among legislators. Is, is that accurate? I, I think that is true nationally, Neil. I think there is a real a kind of wave of reform that is sweeping the country. I think Wisconsin is very much behind the curve on those kinds of reforms. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly true in the area of, of solitary confinement and uh, also in terms of early release for people who have extremely long sentences. In both those areas, other states are making much greater progress. Were you aware of this 30 some years ago when you were in the DA's office, Jerry? Frankly, no. I mean, I, I did not see it as the both systematic and systemic problem that it really is. I think uh, for many people who work in the system, uh, we're all kind of in our own silos, and we don't really see the, the larger uh, effects that our individual decisions make on the whole, the whole system. And so I think that Wisconsin's prison population has grown 300% in the last 20 years. And that growth has been fueled by many, many individual decisions with no one really taking responsibility for the overall policies that drive that. What, Talib, what's the first thing people need to know about the criminal justice system right now? Is that the people who are being sent to prison, they're sent there for three reasons. Addiction, addiction, mental illness, and education. Not in that exact order, but that's the underlying reasons for that. So the, the, the majority of the people, or you're saying even a, a vast majority of the people, have addiction issues, yes. have mental health issues, yes. and do not have a level of education correct. That, would have, that would have kept them out that of prison. Yeah. I mean, obviously you know that flies in the face of conventional wisdom, which is people there are there for because they are dangerous and have committed violent crimes. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Neil, it is true that people are in prison. Uh, some people are in prison because they are dangerous and have committed violent crimes. And those people probably need to be in prison and need to be in prison uh, as long as it takes them to, uh, to be reformed. The deeper issues, though, are, as Tlaib pointed out, the number of people that are in prison for drug-related offenses yeah. and the number of people who are in prison because of mental illness. And those are two areas where I think we could make significant progress uh, mm -hmm. without endangering public safety. So, so what is it like? I mean, you know, we have a fairly stereotypical image of what it's like to be in prison. From your perspective, Lee, what would you, how would you describe it? Well, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare once you get there. You know, you have to you have to learn these rules and regulations, you know, and you have to catch up quickly because you're responsible for your own action. You know, they put the rule book in your hand and now you're responsible for it. 
So you go through whatever amount of time that you're doing, being responsible for whatever rule violation that you may be uh, charged with. So, you know, you're responsible for your own action. Yeah. And so that's an issue that you have to deal with on a daily basis because that's where you are. You if, have to if, understand the rules and regulations. If you're willing, so, which of the three areas, how, or all of them, contributed to your being in prison? Well, basically all of them. And I really didn't learn until recently that my biggest problem was the education. Because mm -hmm. I've never been addicted. I learned since I've been released that I, I'm mentally ill. I do have a mentally ill efficiency, mm -hmm. but mine was education, mm -hmm. you know. And, and which and they probably contributed to each other, I would think. Right. Yeah, right. They all intertwine. Yeah, they all intertwine. It entwined in in a very uh, complicated way. Uh, many states uh, project their future need for prison beds based on third grade reading scores. And just think about how self-destructive that is. So the money that could be used to improve education instead goes into building prisons. It's a predictor it's a of, predictor. The that, of the prison that, population. Well, is. That it is used as a predictor right. of future mm -hmm. prison growth. So the education stuff is all very uh, complicated and intertwined and needs some real policy analysis that's being done even in states as as surprising as Texas and Kansas uh, that have traditionally been seen as very uh, tough on crime states are moving to much more uh, uh, systematic and analytical uh, programs to evaluate the whole criminal justice system and again Wisconsin is uh, is way behind on those efforts. I want to I want to spend a little time focusing on 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 the issue of solitary confinement, and we're going to do that when we come back right after this. Good. Mm. Reverend Hancock, what are we looking at here? Well, this is uh, a drawing of a solitary confinement cell that Tlaib made and is the basis, uh, the blueprint for what we use to design our traveling replica of a solitary confinement cell. And there it is. And uh, we've taken that cell around and it is now uh, in Milwaukee at Marquette University. Just spent a week at Edgewood, right? Right, it was at Edgewood yep. for a week and the whole point is that uh, prisons and particularly solitary confinement are generally out of sight and out of mind. And before you can reform evil, you have to see evil. And this was a way of, of, of letting people see exactly what solitary confinement looks like and feels like. And Tlaib is our is our consultant in this and he can talk about the the number of blocks in the mm -hmm. cell and mm -hmm. how he made the drawing did you did you make it in the cell or are you even permitted to have the materials to draw in a solitary confinement well yes I, I made it in the cell okay and no I am not permitted <laughs> to have the material or to get caught with the material because that's a violation within itself and it's a breach of contract a, um, Security, they don't want information that uh, depicts the inside of a solitary confinement or prison period to be, to be drawn or viewed, let alone being, to be sent out. What's the most common reason for being sent to solitary? Um, well, rule infraction. Yeah, whatever that fighting. means. Fighting, yeah. I mean, isn't that part of the problem? It's pretty yeah. arbitrary? Well, it's... Uh, it, arbitrary is one way to describe it. Um, torture is another way to describe it. Uh -huh. And obviously there are times when you're running a complicated, uh, dangerous place like a prison where you're going to need to separate people from the general population, right. either for their own protection, the protection of others, 
or for some evaluative purpose. And that's why the United Nations has set uh, a 15 day limit on solitary confinement. Beyond 15 days, it's considered torture. And in Wisconsin, uh, as part of the, the code that governs the, the security in prisons, an inmate can be sentenced to 180 days in solitary confinement for loitering. And that just means simply not, not responding to an officer's command as promptly as the officer thinks you should. So in that sense, it is, it is arbitrary mm -hmm. and goes way beyond anything that is recognized internationally as being either therapeutic or necessary for security. Um, I, I don't want to unnecessarily complicate things, so the, the, I'm, because I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the Dane County Jail for, right, uh, and, and, and they're right. very, very different, right? right. I, I, but, I, but Sheriff Mahoney makes it pretty clear, and at least I've heard him say, that no one who goes into solitary doesn't have the condition worsened that right. they went into solitary and, for. And, and uh, Sheriff Mahoney is exactly right on that. And also, uh, Rick Ramish, who was Sheriff Mahoney's predecessor and is now the head of the Colorado uh, prison system, uh, spent a night in solitary and came out and said exactly the same thing. So, I mean, there's a real uh, Madison connection a real recognition that this is not the way to treat people and that it is it does more harm than good. How did you do it, Talib? Well, Neil, you have to find the right formula in your life. Stay busy, reading, uh, just looking, just finding something to do. You have to find something to do. You have to stay busy. You know, complaining, it goes nowhere. That's a part of the neglect and abuse there. But you just have to find something to keep yourself busy. And part of the, the uh, mental illness is there, you know what I mean, is, is you can find some of the most weirdest things to do to stay busy. You might see something uh, speck on your sheet and you begin to pick these things, continue to pick these things just to keep you busy until yeah. the next meal time comes around or something like that. But just to stay busy or read a book and you might complete that book in short length of time, you know. How yeah. how accurate was 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 that little video piece to leave of, of of the sound, of of the noise in the in the cell? It is so real, so surreal. Yes, that's just what happens, and even worse in certain facilities because you have people who are playing chess and they're calling these chess numbers out, and they do it by shift, you know, by shifts. So you know, like the first shift, the second shift, and the third shift. So while you're sleeping or the next cell of people are sleeping, another set of people come up and they're playing so and they challenge each other for three shifts. Yeah. You know, and it gets worse. That is the most uh, common reaction we have when people spend time in our mm -hmm. replica cell. Because we do have that sound as part of the experience. Mm -hmm. And many, many people come out and say, Wow, that was that was the most I was most affected by that by the noise because people think that solitary confinement is solitude that it's going to be like being in a monastery. Mm -hmm. It is not. It is crazy loud, twenty four seven. And as Talib has told us, the lights are always on. The lights are always on, and the only time uh, it gets quiet is uh, for about ten minutes when meals are served. During time serving meals, or uh, May at time, something like that, you know, get the meds and go on. Then, and many times, people who are on medication, they just drop out. They're asleep. <laughs> you know, once once they take their meds, they're sleeping. You know? Now, do, do you do you propose a specific alternative? I mean, it's one thing to to help to, to raise the recognition about the inhumanity right. of, of, of solitary confinement, but in terms of of, of separating inmates, right. protecting inmates, any of that kind of stuff. Are there alternatives that there, are there available? There are absolutely alternatives. And uh, it starts with uh, recognizing that solitary confinement is not an appropriate treatment for people who are mentally ill. By mm -hmm. some standards, uh, at Waupon, for example, the oldest prison in Wisconsin, uh, 
as many as two-thirds of the inmates in solitary confinement have been diagnosed with mental illness. And so you start with saying, okay, we're not going to put people who are mentally ill in solitary. Yep. We're going to find a different way to do that. And there's a great model right here in Wisconsin for that. All right, I want to, I want to talk about that model okay. when we come back right Good. after this. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to make sure. We are talking about the prison reform movement across this country here in Wisconsin, very much uh, uh, locally this morning, with Reverend Jerry Hancock, uh, who is, among other things, um, a part of the Wisdom organization, as is Talib Akbar. Uh, Wisdom is a prison reform group in the state. Uh, we were talking about a, a model program for uh, identifying people with mental illness. Right. And, and I'm really interested in that because it's... It is such a big part of, of, of this conversation and an alternative to how we think about exactly. people in the prison. And uh, I, I would encourage the, the model that is available is what is going on at the women's prison at Tachita. And about 10 years ago, as a result of an investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice, Wisconsin was required to reform the way it handled solitary confinement and mental illness at the women's prison. And they have constructed a separate unit that deals with people who are mentally ill rather than simply putting them in solitary confinement. So what we've asked for is a similar investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice about conditions in men's prisons in Wisconsin that could lead to the same kinds of reforms. So there is a, a process uh, that can result in major changes in the way solitary confinement is used. We've done it before in Wisconsin, but, and this is really important, it required outside pressure to do it. I see no interest by the current administration in doing anything to reform the use of solitary confinement. And, and in the current budget submitted by the governor, he simply continues the program of mass incarceration and solitary confinement that's been going on for years. Did I misinterpret uh, within the last six, eight weeks, Jerry, um, uh, uh, information coming out of the corrections department that indicated a willingness to rethink some of these policies? Well, they there is they've given some lip service, mm -hmm. and they announced some new rules for solitary confinement that they worked on for a couple of years. Those new rules do not make any substantive changes in the way solitary confinement can be used. Again, you can be sentenced to 180 days, six months in solitary confinement for loitering. So we're still waiting to see uh, exactly what those changes might mean. And my, my sincere belief is that it's going to require outside pressure probably from the U.S. Department of Justice and civil rights uh, analysis to deal with these issues. This is so complicated. As I listen to this, I'm, uh, you know, I think we're not, we're not doing any favors to um, re-entering inmates. So we're talking about untreated mental illness, untreated addiction issues, mm -hmm. um, uh, really, uh, you know, inhumane treatment in the prison. Mm -hmm. And now we are asking the community to do a better job of, of helping re-entering inmates come back into society and get work. Mm -hmm. what, what do we need to know, Talib? Well, we need to know that these guys, um, they do need help. You know, they need assistance. They need someone to recognize the position that they're in because DOC 
stands for more than the Department of Correction. It stands for Department of Corruption. And these people who are there would have a chance if DOC would give them a chance or let the public intervene and help with this, but they're not doing that. And the public has a great interest in this because of the amount of treatment that they are not receiving, yeah. that they should be receiving. Yeah, right. I, I would just say that, uh, I mean, I, Tlaib knows exactly what he's talking about. I think the sense of, of corruption is not in terms of, of criminal kinds of corruptions. It's the corruption of the ideal of rehabilitation. That's what's been lost. You hardly ever hear anyone talk about rehabilitation. It's all, all punitive. And it's the corruption of the ideal that is so sad. Which must, must, must very much look like and feel like corruption if you're in that powerless position yeah. in, exactly. in, in the prison. Exactly. But it's, it's the, the corruption of the ideal rather than any kind of money under the table or anything. And, and really, Neil, the, in a way, the, the corruption of the ideal is, is so much harder to deal with and so much sadder. We got we got to get out of here. We show, we're showing a, a graphic of Madison Action Day coming up on Wednesday, April 29th. A community conversation right. around criminal justice issues. Right. Thank you both very much. We're going to come back and wrap up for the record right after this. My thanks to Reverend Hancock and to Leave Akbar, and we'll see you next week on For the Record.